Welcome to Our Scars Speak. My name is Christina Miner. I am the host of this podcast. And before I begin, always give a disclaimer that we are just here to provide education and to also um, just truly share our story and what we've been through and hopefully it'll help someone else. We never advise anyone against go against their medical professionals. We want you to go and speak to your professionals and do as they tell you to do. But also, if you have questions, ask them. But we are not here to provide advice for your specific situation. So tonight, I am the guest of the podcast, and I'm going over um, tips about caregiving. Many of you may know or may not know a little bit about my background. So to kind of kind of go a little bit backwards, I want to share some things with you all. And the first thing is that obviously many of you know that I am a breast cancer survivor. So I can speak from the standpoint of receiving care and being one that was not that vulnerable. Um, Also, I can speak from the point of caregiving in the medical field. When I used to be a, a certified nursing assistant level two in North Carolina, I did that for many years. I also worked um, alongside an orthopedic for a few years in South Carolina. So I have a lot of history in as far as occupation wise, working in the medical field, ICU, CCU, which is cardiac care unit and intensive care unit, emergency room, urgent care, all the floors. When people needed to change their schedule, I was right there to do it. I love caregiving. I loved serving people and people who were going through various things. But the ultimate as far as caregiving for me that I witnessed was my family. A lot of my family, um, they had cancer um, on my my sister and my two brothers, their family, actually, biologically, their family had a lot of cancer. And I was able to see how the family pulled together and cared for one another. Um, my family on my father's side did not have any cancer um, I was no cancer genes that I know of, or my mother's side, I was the only one. But to see that side of my family go through cancer, it was very interesting to, like I said, watch the family pull together once they found out they had cancer and no one was sent to a rest home or anything of that nature. They care, the family care give, care give for them, as well as had other people to come in to help with um, caring for them as well. Then my sister was sick in 2016, I think it was, and she um, had to get a liver transplant. And through that transplant process, it was about a year that she had to go back and forth to the doctors. And it was, it was severe. It was to the point where they thought that she only had, you know, three months to live. And now we're here, you know, God's good. She had transplant. She's been doing great ever since, but through probably about a year or a little bit more, I care gift for her directly. And that was very eye opening um, to be in the shoes of a caregiver full time. That was around the clock as needed when she needed me. And so that was very a different perspective that I had not gone through. But I felt I had the skill set enough to do it. And, you know, I did it. So As a cancer survivor, though, I must say, when we hear those words, as I often say, it is life-changing, life-altering. And if we're people who are independent and we've been the caregivers all our lives, it's very hard to receive that in return. It's very hard to be vulnerable and receive someone to care for us. So a lot of times hearing the diagnosis can present anxiety. It can present depression, sadness, guilt. Um, grief. It can present so many different emotions that we go through because of the different steps of from hearing the diagnosis, going through the treatment, and then after treatment. There's various steps that we go through and not only steps that we go through with our physicians, but steps that we go through mentally. So with that being said, it was hard. It was hard to know that, okay, in a matter of, you know, a few seconds, I go from being this person who cared for the whole family if they needed me to a person who now may need to care myself. And I didn't know what that was going to look like. I didn't know if I was, I didn't, cause I, you know, I just had the biopsy report at that point and I didn't know if they're going to find invasive cancer. I didn't know if it was going to be metastatic. I didn't know <clears throat> if I was going to have to go, excuse me, go through chemo, chemo. I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to have to be on hospice. I had no clue what I was facing. So that was very, very unnerving for me. But once I got the information that I needed, 
I just took each step at a time, but I knew I needed to develop a team of people that were going to be my caregivers. And I, and when you're deciding upon caregivers, it's a very, um, it's a very private decision. You pick whoever you want to pick, as long as they're willing to help you. And no one should force anyone on anybody. Like you should not force yourself on the person who's going through this life altering situation. And it can be very strenuous on them enough just hearing the diagnosis. So with that being said, I'm kind of talking a little bit, I'm definitely talking about caregiving, but I'm also kind of trying to give you a little bit of understanding of what the person who is dealing with the diagnosis is going through mentally. And I'm only sharing from my perspective because everybody's diagnosis and treatment plans are so different. And even when I go over these tips, some of them could be for like short-term, some of it could be for long-term. So I hope you can grasp grasp something that may uh, you can identify with with your situation or someone that you know and you might can share some of this information was given to me by my physician which I know she doesn't mind me sharing but the majority of it was from my own personal experience far as actually being a caregiver so I will say the first thing in particular is be sensitive to the patient's emotions when they fluctuate because they're going to fluctuate they're going to be you're going to feel like you're on a whole roller coaster with this person one day they might have highs the next day they may have lows and it may not even be the next day. It may be the next second or the next minute. And this, these tips really can be used beyond breast cancer. You can use this for someone who is disabled or just, you know, they found out maybe, um, you know, maybe they've had a heart attack or something and now they have to have caregivers. So this can be used for anything. So you have to understand that not only will their moods alter because of what they found out, their moods may alter also because of the very simple fact that they're on medication and that medication may have them moody and that medication may have them completely out of their mind. I cannot speak from a chemotherapy or radiation standpoint or even being on tamoxifen or some hormone drugs, but I can speak from the standpoint of having an operation and being put on a lot of drugs, <laughs> a lot of drugs from gabapentin to, I think I was on morphine at one time, Dilaudin. I was on a, a array of drugs. So not only am I, was I dealing with like the frustration of it all, but then now you add the drugs to it. So with the drugs, it just truly had me going bonkers. I'm just being honest. Like my sister had, my sister was my caregiving team, part of my caregiving team, which it was like our roles reversed. So kind of like the backtrack, you have to identify who your caregivers are going to be. So for me, it was my sister. It was my husband. My mom came here for a period of time. My son was here and my daughter was here, but my sister was really in those trenches with me. Um, she was there at night beside me on the other recliner sleeping and making sure my medication was given to me. But she also seen the not so good sides of me, which and the whole family did it. Let me just be honest. The whole family did. Um, and what I mean by the moods and just not being yourself, I was on all this medication. I, you know, I, I can barely move my arms because I've had a double mastectomy and I dropped a pill one night. I went to pick it up. My sister told me, don't do anything. Just sit there, take your medicine. But I dropped it and she had to go to the restroom or something. And so I was like, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna pick up this medicine and I'm gonna take it. And why did I do that? Because when I picked up that medicine, I started spinning in my head because the medicine had me everywhere. But then my body did a whole 360 and I fell backwards, fell into the wall, slid down the wall, broke, what was a guitar hero setup that the kids had broke that it was a mess. She comes running out. My husband is come running out. My son comes running like, what are you doing? because I wasn't sitting down. And I mentally was not there. I almost fell down a flight of steps. My sister had to grab me. So be very patient with them because within all of that, even though now I can laugh about it, thank God I ain't fall down steps. But even through all of that, mentally, I was not there. And they're not, and some patients are not because of the drugs, it'll have them every which way, except for where they used to be. So you have to just kind of be patient with them. And then sometimes the medicines as they're getting off of them can make them a little irritable. 
or while they're on them, because I mean, I doubt they go through withdrawals, but like if they're taking a lot of that medication, it should be within a short period of time. Anyway, I had strong narcotics because I had severe pain, which was due to the breast implant illness and the capsular contractor, which could not be exactly identified. A lot of times doctors may give pain medication for a short, short extended, you know, short period of time. And that's it. Sometimes a little bit longer. It depends on the patient, but please try to be patient with them. Do not be scared also if you're a friend to contact them because friends can be caregivers as well. And you're part of that caregiving team because the family may need to depend on you sometimes in order to help them if they need to go to the store. So if you're a friend from the outside looking in and you have a good rapport with the family and good rapport with the individual who's going through this, reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out. Be careful what you say, but don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to suggest let me make you dinner, suggest, hey, if you're close enough, let me take the kids to the park. Let me take, you know, um, let me go pick you up grocery. Let me come stay with her or him while they're going through treatment or while they're recovering, you know, play a part in that. You can definitely play a part as a caregiver. Sometimes this text message is really good enough because they may be going through treatment or they may be, you know, severely, severely ill from the medications and different things. And maybe just a text message just to say, hey, look, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. And I hope you're okay. I'm here for you if you need me. And sometimes I hear for you if you need me. Um, some people prefer for a person to say, hey, look, I'll do this for you versus if you need me, because sometimes people don't have a tendency to respond back to that with, yes, I do need this because they're having issues being vulnerable. So maybe if you're close enough, especially have a good rapport, maybe present some ideas of things that you could do or present the question of what may I, what can I help you with? That kind of throws the ball a little bit back in their court. They can have a little bit more control over things that they may need. They may just need their medication picked up or just need someone to come over and be silent. So, you know, try to be that for them. Um, don't feel bad if they don't respond to your text message, to your uh, emails, to your phone calls. They're going through a lot. They're going through a lot. I can't stress that enough. Their whole world has been flipped upside down. So do not feel, um, you know, do not become offended when they don't respond to you at all because sometimes that'll happen. Eventually they may reach back or they may just put something on. A lot of times I did things on Facebook so everybody could kind of see what was going on. Everyone is not as transparent as I am. Some people never talk about it. Some people do just respect the space. Do not rush them through difficult things that you may or may not want to hear. So if they're in a moment where they are ready to talk and they're ready to tell you stuff, they might even be ready to show you their scars. Try to deal with it. Don't rush them through it because it's uncomfortable for you, okay? Because a lot of times certain conversations can be uncomfortable for us as caregivers because it's like, oh my God, like I don't even know what to say about that. I don't even know how to relate to you. They're not looking for you to relate to them. They're just looking for someone to listen. So just be there to listen, even if you don't want to hear it. Now, if they start showing you their scars and they're like, look, you know, this is what I had to go through. I don't know. I mean, that it may be a little sensitive for you and you may be very sensitive and get nauseous. <laughs> um, so you may want to kind of give a disclaimer, like, I don't know if I can handle that. And, and that's OK. But try to allow them to be as vocal as possible with you if they get in the place where they're ready to share everything. And that's not necessarily the time either to interject. That's just the time to be quiet. <laughs> it's just the time to be quiet and listen to them go on as they like. Um, within that, a lot of times what we do, some people do friends, caregivers, because it's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable situation. They're talking about things you can't relate to. You don't know how to meet them where they are, but you being quiet is meeting them where they are. I, I promise you that. But it's not the time to go and say, well, you know what? You're going to be okay. Uh, just stay positive. That might not be the time. It may be, let them sit in that moment of stressing how they're sad and they may cry and they may get angry. They may even start cussing and they usually don't. They may do some things that you never seen them do or say some things you never thought in a thousand years they would say, but let them be in that moment. 
And as time progressed within the conversation, sometimes what will happen, you'll see them kind of start changing a little bit and they'll start calming down a little bit. And that's the time when you may be able to present some comforting words of I'm here, I support you, not necessarily you're going to be okay, because sometimes we don't want to hear that. I'm just being honest. Um, But at that point, maybe you can offer a little bit more comfort towards them. Also, every cancer situation is different. So do not try to compare their situation with another person that you know, or even your own situation. Be leery of that, because they're not trying to hear that either. I literally had a person, um, I had a person to tell me pretty much every day, you know, every time I look at you, I get sad and I start crying because I think of my loved one that passed away. I hear that. Like, I did not want to hear that every day of my life. Um, and they would, you know, back it up with, oh, you know, I'm so thankful you made it, but so did such and such. However, she died. Um, she was doing great and then she died. I didn't want to hear that. I did not want to hear it. I I didn't have anything to give back to them in their moment of thinking about it. And they had nothing to really give me. I, I and later I knew, I, I felt I knew where they were coming from. I don't think they meant anything wrong, but the timing of it all was a lot because I had just had my chest opened up and taken the cancer out. And I wasn't even, I didn't even have scar tissue really built up yet. I was still in the very beginning throes of things, um, sort of speak. So I didn't want to hear that. And a lot of us, you know, we don't want that comparison. I had another person to tell me after, right after having a double mastectomy, you shouldn't have let them do that because now it's going to spread all over your body. Mm, I didn't want to hear that either. (laughs) And because some things are myths. So you want to make for sure that you're not presenting a whole bunch of myths to the person because they're going through what's next, which things are subject to change when you have breast cancer or going through breast cancer treatment. Things are subject to change at any moment. You're constantly going to the doctors and to hear certain myths that are out there that are scary. Um, another one is don't eat no sugar because it's you're feeding the cancer. Well, that's not how my cancer grew. My cancer grew from estrogen and progesterone. That's how my cancer grew. It did not grow from sugar. Now, sugar can be bad if you eat large quantities of it for anything. But there's certain myths out there, um, which Dr. Spina is going to come on and talk about some of them eventually. But we don't need that right then at all. And even if it's not a myth, we just the negative part of the cancer could cut, you know, well, are you scared about the cancer coming back? And there's a time and place for everything. And just try to be very sensitive in conversation um, when it comes to that. Do not flood them with information unless they desire to communicate that need, especially if you have never gone through it. Excuse me. I'm so sorry about that. So far as sharing information, I think is good. I think sometimes we can overshare. Uh, Sometimes I get excited and I want to overshare. So we have to be careful with giving information, even when they haven't asked for it. They haven't asked us for nothing. And we're just spilling information. So it's good to say in situations like that, if you think that you have something that's very beneficial for the person to hear or um, some information that they may need to know with their particular situation, you may say, I'm so sorry. You may say that, you know, can I share this information with you? And they may say, yes, absolutely. You can share some information with me. But if they're not trying to hear it, don't force it. Or if they have a certain look on their face, try to understand their body language. Try to understand that they're trying to even be sensitive to you when they're going through as well. Um, Another thing is allow allow them to talk. and don't say anything. So uh, you've heard me say that a lot during this particular um, podcast. You don't want to continue to over talk them because sometimes they just need silence. They need for you to be present, but not say a word. So that's when you have your active listening, right? They may be in the middle of, okay, I want you to just be silent and I want to be silent. And we're just going to sit here in silence and we're going to watch TV or we're not going to watch nothing. I may just want to play on my phone or I may just want to read a magazine, but I don't want you to talk to me 
and I don't want to talk to you. There's those moments. Then there's those moments where I want to talk, like I've talked about before. And in some situations, they want to talk about it in depth. Some situations, they just want to talk and they just want you to listen. And when it's time to listen, be an active listener. And active listening is different from just listening. Active listening, you're putting your phone down. You're not paying attention to distractions around you. You're actively paying attention, attention to that person who's speaking to you. You are looking at that patient or friend or whomever it is. You're looking at them intently on purpose and paying attention to them. They're the only person in the room. And it could be a room full of people, but you pay attention to them. You put everything aside. You even lean in with your body. You present as I am listening to you. You do nonverbals, shaking your head. Not necessarily a lot of talking, if any at all. So be present for that. The other thing that I want to mention is respect their journey and decision that they make about their treatment plan. Treatment plans are very sensitive. Some people go flat. Some people get implants. Some people do deep flat. Some people um, don't get any surgery. Some people don't get any treatment. They go completely 100% holistic. These are the choices that the patient makes. That's their right to make that decision. We are not there to tell them, no, that's the best thing for you. No, we're not. We help them gather the information to make the wisest choice for themselves, but we do not tell them what to do with what they need to do in order to heal properly or to get treated. And there are times where I have seen people that go to holistic route and they passed away. And I often wonder if they would have went a different route, would they have lived? And we think those things sometimes, but it's not for us to judge. It's not for us to judge. If they 100% feel in their heart, this is the best thing for me. If, if the, the doctor said, get a double mastectomy um, and you still need to go through maybe radiation, chemo or whatever. And I say, oh, nope, I'm not doing all that, but I'll do the operation. That's my choice. As much as you love them, as much as you want to see them, maybe get everything the doctor throws at them. It is not your choice, not your decision to tell them what they need to do with their body. Okay. So we have to respect that. When you're a caregiver, you also interact with the family. A lot of times when you're caregiving someone for someone, they just don't have the strength to go around and tell family and friends everything that's going on. If they allow you the opportunity to share with their loved ones or their friends what they're going through, be that spokesperson for them. Also be that guard for them. If they don't want a whole bunch of people coming to the house, if they don't want people coming to the hospital or whatever the case may be, guard them. You are their guard as well. You tell people, you know, I appreciate it. I thank you, but they can't have guests right now. You know, they're, they're going through, you, you don't have to tell them anything. Just know. Thank you. Feel free to send flowers monetary gifts, whatever the case may be, but they're not seeing guests. And sometimes people can't see guests because they're on chemo and their immune system is shot. So they don't want to be around a whole bunch of people that may be carrying germs around them. It could be as simple as that. Well, it's not simple, but it could be that, or it could just be mentally, they cannot take it. They cannot take being in front of people and talking to people about their diagnosis. They're living this thing out. And it's not fun and it's not easy. So as a caregiver, sometimes we have to be that buffer between them and family and friends, between everybody. So make for sure that um, you are informing people as they want you to inform them. The other thing is make sure the patient has you down as the caregiver. So that way you have information that you can get in, you know, and communicate with the doctors on their behalf. Now, this is when you're really caregiving to the extreme that I care give for my sister and my sister care give for me. We were there. Like she was on all my information. I was on all her information. She was allowed to talk to my doctor. She was allowed to get the information from my doctor. The same went for her situation. I was there as well. So you want to make for sure that you have the information. You want to make for sure that you have all the doctors that they have in their life, whether it be a PCP, their primary care doctor, um, if they have a cardiologist, oncologist, breast surgeon, nurse navigator, social worker, therapist, whomever that they see, and also a list of the pharmacies that they um, also connect it to. So you want to make sure you have all that information. And it's good to have a binder where you can keep all their pathology reports, 
start assisting them with getting um, a print, usually it's on a jump drive, sometimes a CD of their um, x-rays and, well, not necessarily x-rays, because if they have cancers, be more mammograms, ultrasounds, MRI, CT scans, PET scans, get all of that downloaded um, on the jump drive. So that way, if they go for a second opinion, or if they just need it to keep, they have that. Putting stuff in a binder is a lifesaver. Pathology reports, list of all people involved. You want that in case you have to communicate with the doctor um, or share something on behalf of the patient with the physician. Make sure all doctors are informed of the diagnosis. If the PCP does not know about the patient having cancer or the cardiologist or pulmonologist doesn't know about this cancer diagnosis, make for certain that they know. Make for certain because they need to know because if something, say if they go through radiation or something like that, and there's other things they may need to check on their end to make for sure that everything is being, um, that they're collaborating with the oncologists and the breast surgeons. Because sometimes they don't talk. Sometimes they're not in the same network. So they don't have the same portal. My PCP was at Kenner. My doctor was over at, um, start out Southside, but then Chippenham. So you can have doctors in various places and they're on different portals. So they can't see what each other is saying. So it's important to make for sure that everybody knows about this diagnosis and what medications this patient is on. Assist them with setting up their portal as well, their patient portal. Sometimes they just don't feel like it. They may not even want to know about the portal. If they if they choose to, of course, with everything that you do, you are having conversation with that person about their business that you're taking care of. You're not just out there, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. No, you're having a discussion. You and this individual are sitting down once everything, you've gone to the doctors, you have information, you're sitting down and you're having a conversation that these are the areas where you can help. And if they agree to it, then you help them in these areas. So you're setting up the portal, you help them with that, you aid them with contacting anyone as um, far as their bills. If they have outstanding bills, or maybe they don't have outstanding bills, but you don't want them to become outstanding, you may need to talk to them about, okay, how's your car payment going? How's your college loans going? Do we need to contact these individuals to see if you can get a period of a deferment or you know some some type of pause on your bills until you can get things situated because everybody's insurance don't pay for everything 100% which can damage their finances you also may need to help link them to other organizations to help them get funding for things that they may need so those are all things that you want to make for sure that you have for them if the disability is needed also you may need to help them get on Social security, um, disability. I don't know the steps to that, but we had Erin on not too long ago and she talked about it from a metastatic standpoint. It's usually if you're stage four, but you can help them um, contact an attorney or someone that can help them with that process. If the patient needs a therapist, um, see and say if they need a therapist, they need physical therapy, they need psychological therapy, they need a nursing assistant if it's, you know, to the point where maybe they have hospice, they may need hospice. If that patient is there, you need to make for sure if they're on that level of care, you need to make for sure to help them find out if their insurance covers everything. Because you one, one thing you don't want your patient to do is have extra stress thinking, oh, hey, my insurance pays for this. And then they start using it and realize my insurance does not pay for that at all. So that's adding more stress. Uh, we talked about the binder and making for sure of that. Okay, in some cases, the patient may not have family available to care give to the point of handling their finances or their medical advice. So with saying this, now this is very personal and this is something that you have to talk to them about, but there's a thing called a medical power of attorney. And there's also a financial power of attorney. And there's other power attorneys out there. This is a conversation that should be had if you are really having to care give on the level where they may need for you to make certain decisions about them medically. If they were, you know, like for me, I um, when I went into surgery, my husband knew exactly what I wanted. Um, so I didn't really worry about that. Plus I had a living will. So I wasn't worried about, you know, it, and everybody knew where my living will was and all that. 
So I wasn't worried about it. However, if you don't have certain things in place, you may need to give your caregiver and talk to an attorney about this, of course, about a medical power of attorney. And that's just for them to make decisions about you regarding medical things that could happen. Like if you um, get on life support and say you go to surgery, you get on life support and the doctors come in and like, okay, well, we may, you know, what do you want us to do? Keep her on life support, take her off life, like any of those issues with that medical power of attorney, that person can make those decisions. Now with the medical power of attorney, say if like, for instance, if I, you know, I married to Richard and I didn't want him to make those decisions for me, then I want my sister to make those decisions. I could get a power of, medical power of attorney to override him from making decisions on my behalf, even though I'm married to him. So those are things that sometimes we don't think about that you might need to think about. When it comes to your the medical appointments, you want to make for sure you play a part in that. You want to make for sure that you are there with them, assisting them during those appointments. I've shared with you all many times before on the tips for consultation, what that looks like. If you're a caregiver, you want to be there. I don't. They don't necessarily have to be to a point where they're not thinking. Even like I said, in the very big, we could be completely functioning, but in those appointments, sometimes we miss certain information. So your caregiver going with you is another set of ears, another set of eyes, right? They can hear things that you might can't hear or receive at that moment. And you're thinking, oh, I got all all this in my head and I'm good to go. I thought a few things and I went back and asked my sister and she's like, no, the doctor didn't say that, but she did say this. And I'm like, I don't even remember her saying that. That's because mentally I was not there. I was physically there. I was not mentally there. I thought I was, but I wasn't. So thank goodness that her, my husband, my mom was there at that time, but then for other appointments afterwards, my sister was there for those appointments and she was another set of ears. You can also, even if you're the caregiver, you can ask, can I record this appointment? You want to make for sure before they go to appointments on a regular, um, keep a log book, anything that's changed, anything, any questions or concerns that, that you may have, the patient may have, and you all talk together about, let's present this to the doctor. Now, if The patient does not want to talk to the doctor about it. You cannot go in there and start running your mouth. Like, I I wouldn't do that. Like, even if you have power of attorney, possibly could, but I wouldn't do it because it can cause tension and it's it's just not right. Like, if they, you guys still respect their privacy. So have those conversations about leading up to the appointments. What's some things that you can discuss? What's some things that may need to be brought to the attention of the doctor that has changed? Maybe you see a change. So that's good to have those second pair of ears and log everything daily. My sister's very faithful about when she was going through her, um, when she was going through her treatments and different things, um, she was faithful. Every morning she would write down all her medicine. She would write down her blood pressure. She would write down everything. I was doing it initially and then she was just on it. And I let her do that even when I may have been keeping record of things to the side that she didn't know about, just like little notes of things that I see that she may, you know, was experiencing. She did the same thing for me when I was going through it. She wrote down my medication faithfully, my blood pressure, her blood pressure. She writes it. Even to this day, she does that for herself. So as a caregiver, if you know that you might need to check their blood pressure, their temperature or something, have a log book. And make for sure you have schedules. And that's the other thing I want to talk about. Make for sure you have a medication schedule. I've already talked about the list of medication, but scheduling the medication, scheduling the food, scheduling when you're going to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, scheduling. This is the time we're going to take our shower. This is the time we're going to start preparing for bed. Now, for some of you, you may say that sounds kind of childish. No, it's not. Because why? It keeps the schedule in place where it makes that person accountable. It makes you accountable. And then when you need to take a break as a caregiver, you know, between one o'clock and three o'clock, I can take a break. It could be that they don't need 24 hour care. So between one and four, let's say I can go or one and three, I can go to the gym. I can have my shower. And I'm good to go with taking care of myself during that time. Or I can just go read a book for about an hour or two, because that's going to be my downtime. Or I can have another friend to come into the house. If the person needs 24 hour care, I can have another person to come into the house and wait. You know, if I have it set up that way, the caregiver sometimes need a caregiver and have that person to come in to take on a shift so I can go out maybe for a walk. 
maybe just to go check on my family or what have you. So you need to make for sure that these things are in place so you don't get worn out and so that you all are all on a schedule and you have these times where you know that you have pockets of time to maybe even prepare for the next thing. So say if I come back from the gym at four o'clock and I take my shower, I know I'm going to take, and this is how specific I was um, with my sister. I would say, okay, I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to go to the gym. I will go to the gym for an hour. I'll be back home at six o'clock. By 6.30, I will have my shower, do everything that I need to do. And then at that point, I'll start making her breakfast. It'll be done by seven. We'll make sure she has her breakfast to take with the first set of medication. That's how specific, and I wrote it down. So those are things that you need to know. And bathing, bathing, you may need to assist them with bathing. So you need to have that schedule. The next morning could be the same thing. Or at night, like, okay, we're going to have your snack at 8.30 because I know that you have to take your medicine at nine o'clock. So at 8.30, you'll have something on your stomach. You can take your medicine. Well, I'll let the doctor tell you that. It's, it's a range that you can take your medicine. But 8.30, take your medicine, um, eat your snack. By 9.30, you're winding down. I set your TV to what you want it if they can't get up and do things for themselves or whatever the case may be. Maybe they need a bedside commode beside the bed. Make sure that's there. Make sure it's clean. So these are the things that you need to take in consideration when you're caring from so, for someone. And that is from ex intensive care, as far as caregiving to maybe not so intensive. You just gauge it based off the patient. Um, if they have physical therapy exercises, you need to have a schedule for that. Like I said about exercising and things for their day, you may need to take them to physical therapy and they may need to take them to their mental, um, if they have a therapist for mental health, take them there, support them. I wouldn't say go in the room with them unless they want you in there with them. Let them do some things on their own, but get them there so that you know they're there, they're getting treated properly. When they come out, a lot of times with physical therapy, the physical therapist may say, hey, look, we've given them this sheet of paper. This is what they need to do at home. Sometimes the patient may be like, I got this, I'm good. But other times they may need a little help. Even me right now, I go to physical therapy for my back, but it's also helping my chest. And there's certain exercises I cannot do without Richard's help because I need someone to actually pull my arms back so to expand my chest. So don't be afraid to ask for help for those who are the patient and don't be afraid to give it if you're the caregiver and make sure that they're doing it. Uh make sure they do something positive every day. You know, if they like reading, make sure that you have their favorite books or if they like art therapy. I love to paint towards the end. So we went out and got a whole bunch of um, paint. And so I did art therapy right in my house. Like I just painted, we found random stuff on YouTube and I would paint. Help them find support groups if they need it. If that's always good because you're there with them, but also they may need additional support from people who've gone through what they've gone through. If they don't want it, you can't force it on them, but try to really encourage it because there is strength in that. If the patient does um, not I already talked about that, if they don't want company, be that, be that buffer and that barrier. And lastly, I must say, I've given you a lot of information. It's kind of quick, but um. The one thing that I want everyone to really, really know and truly, truly keep at the forefront of your mind when you are especially dealing with, I would say, a breast cancer patient, because that's what we're talking about, but it can be any patient, but I'm talking about specifically breast cancer. Do not, if they get through getting diagnosed, going through treatment, they get through all of that, right? Do not tell them, you're done. It's over with. You're good now. They're not. I cannot stress that enough. When you get this diagnosis, like I've stated, your world has changed. You're no longer who you used to be, okay? The person's no longer who they are, who they used to be. They're a little bit more hyper aware of things. They're a little bit more in tune with their body. They could have already been in tune, but they're even more in tune now. So when we say, okay, they, they've gone through radiation, they've gone through, now they may be on tamoxifen or maybe they're not on any treatment at all, but they're going to the doctor every year now or 
Maybe they're going every six months. Maybe they're going every year. I don't care if they're going every other year. <laughs> Do not tell them it's over. You're fine. You did it. Now you can say you did it in a good way, but it, when you say you did it and it's over, it's done, you don't have to worry about it no more. That's like slapping us in the face because if, like I told you before, if we get a scratch, if we get an itch, if we get a bump, if we get a lump, we are automatically usually thinking, oh my God, did the cancer come back? This is something that we live with every day. A lot of us have to go to the doctor every year. Before that doctor's appointment, we start getting nervous. It This past year, I realized particular times of the year, I started having more anxiety and I could not understand what was going on. But it was around the time that I found out I had breast cancer and it came to fruition that I started having these anxiety attacks out of nowhere. And it was like, Oh, that was the day that I had, this is the month that I found out I had cancer in 2019. Or this is the month that I found out I had a double mastectomy. And that was a trigger. It can be trauma to us can last for a very long time. Trauma is something that we fight every day to renew our mind every day to be positive. But to tell someone that they are fine, they don't have to worry no more. Everything is great. Everything is lovely. Continue to live life as it was because you're over that now is an insult. And I'm not trying to say that to belittle anyone who care gives because I know you mean well. We know you mean well. But it is really an insult because it's so much that we have to go through as we're going through it. And then once it comes to the point, because you got to remember, you went from having your life turned upside down to you going to the doctor every day, you're seeing the doctor every day, that kind of becomes a security blanket, like your doctor and your, you know, your nurses in them, they become a security blanket, they become a support system. And then they're like, okay, treatment's over. You don't see them no more. <laughs> you go from maybe seeing them, you know, once the treatment's over to every month, to every three months, to every six months, to every year, and then you see them no more, except for every year, it's a shock to our system. When we were going to the doctor, literally like every other week or every week, and it was so quick and rapid and everything was moving for like maybe a year, you were going and seeing them on a regular and to see them no more, that's one of your supports being taken away like I said, like a security blanket. And then you're thinking, oh my God, if I'm not getting checked regularly, what if something pops up that I didn't even realize was there? I don't have that doctor to go to. Now, most of the doctors will say, of course, if you have pains or you, you feel something suspicious or something like that, they're, they'll definitely come and let you be seen by them again. Now, some doctors will say, oh, it's nothing to worry about. And sometimes we have to push them a little bit to get some testing. But then when we get tests, scans and stuff, that's maybe an annual thing to do for some of us. Unlike me, I have to find something in order to get tested because the type of cancer I had in a treatment plan I went through. But some of us who get scans or we find something and get a scan, that's a trigger. So you're telling them on one end, you're fine, you're good, everything is great. We'll just wait to the next appointment and you'll be fine then too. It doesn't work that way in our minds. We're thinking, I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to get through this whole life changing issue that I've just experienced. And now I'm trying to acclimate back into life. I'm not thinking like I should. People talk about chemo brain, but there is a cognitive impairment sometimes that happens that they're saying is not just attributed to chemo, but just this attributed to the fact that you went through trauma. And with that being said, we're not thinking like we used to. Sometimes we're scattered. Sometimes you can be talking to us and our mind is somewhere else. And we may have not have gone through chemo treatment. And if we have gone through chemo treatment, it could be even worse because of the effects of the medication. We've gone through surgery. We've had things to happen that doesn't normally happen to people. And it's our trauma, it's our life, but please, 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 I leave you with that. I leave you with that. Do not, do not tell someone that, please. Because you're basically saying, get over it and keep going. And it's not that simple. So instead of saying that, even if you want to say it, give them a hug. Tell them you're still there to support. No matter what happens or don't happen, you're there. 
and we will continue to ride this journey out together. That's better than saying, basically get over it (laughs) or you'll be fine. So those are some tips. It was a lot. It was kind of quick, but um, I want to respect the time of trying to keep everything within an hour. I hope it was beneficial to you. I believe it is for some. For some, you may have already known this and it's just a refresher. But if you know someone who needs these tips, please pass it along. You know, you can find us on podcasts, various podcasts, our YouTube channel here on Facebook, Instagram, share it, share it, subscribe, uh, leave reviews. And I just thank you for coming on tonight. Um, And I hope to see you next week. Hopefully, um, I'll see you next week. And I thank you for your time. And remember that our scars do speak a story. Our mental and physical scars speak a story that can help someone else get through their wounds. Thank you very much. I love you. And until next time, I'll see you then.